Hello and welcome to this Tuesday edition of the Town Meeting Program. Here, in that part of the pandemic known as Phase 2 Reopening. It's a new day, it's a new way. What do you say? May 19th, our talk show is brought to you as always by Cordova Wireless Communications, your local cell phone provider, providing your local talk show, providing wireless services that keep the dollars in town. And with doing business being weird these days, it's nice to have more of those dollars in town. Not to mention the vast quantity that are brought in because of our local telephone cooperative and Cordova Wireless Communications, which is the sister operation, and it just all works. So, if you were following City Council... Yesterday, you heard that things have evolved in terms of the quote-unquote non-essential businesses, which is a government categorization of some type and not a value judgment, and moving from phase one to phase two actually brings us in sync with most of the rest of the state. So, if you want to be able to read the specific documents, we're not in this situation anymore where the phase that Cordova is in is different from the state. And all of the state's attachments, and there are lots of them. What do we go from D through V now with a few exceptions? So the attachments, the links that you'll see on the state site, if you look at Mandate 16, that's the one that has to do with reopening the non-essential businesses gradually. Customers and business owners can see all the current details. And you can also get some personal help from the Chamber of Commerce. Kathy Renfeld has been a beast advocating for local businesses recently. It it really, what, what the Chamber of Commerce is doing in the midst of all this craziness is some of the most powerful work I can ever remember seeing it do. Not just helping people understand the mandates and and complying with the rules, but because, but also, I should say, helping people to kind of navigate the psychology of this. You know, when Kathy and Kathy uh, and I did a show, I I still can't remember if it was. Last Friday or the Friday before. I think it was last Friday, but it might have been two Fridays ago. It's all a mush. Anyway, in that show, which you can find on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Cordova TV, she talked about, you know, a situation where a business owner in this environment might think there's just no way that I can open right now. Uh, There's no way I can deal with this. And, and the chamber, if you talk to the chamber, they can navigate you through that, how you can do at least some form of reopening. And other businesses who are thinking, this is it. My, my business is, is done, given what's going on in the world right now. And again, the chamber can say, well, no, no, let's hold on a minute. Maybe, maybe we can help you rethink your business model a little bit here and uh, help you find a way to be creative and still be able to serve people, whether it's doing more things online or utilizing social media or what have you. So personally, I think it would be a real good idea before being tempted to lose hope to reach out to the chamber and see what they can offer. And one of the things Kathy and I talked about, too, is the importance of not only the businesses understanding the various restrictions and procedures that are required, but customers really should, too. And that's kind of who, how, who I'm thinking about as we go on. Most of the businesses that are reopening or trying to reopen understand a lot of this. They've, they've likely been in preparation. But it's those of us who might be customers of these businesses that might not understand some of these things. And it's when people don't understand what's required that the potential for trouble keeps up. 
either customers may try to pressure a business to relax the rules for them. Oh, you know, can't I be a special case? Can't you not apply this rule to me? And the problem is, is that if you tempt a business owner who wants to do business with you, but at the same time wants to follow the rules, if you put them in a compromising position like that as a customer, you're really putting their business at risk. And if you want to get some kind of an idea of how big that risk is, let me read you this part of Mandate 16 that I think will offer some perspective. Mandate 16, is, again, is the reopening, and it's got the enforcement part laid out here. A violation of a state of Alaska COVID-19 mandate may subject a business or organization to an order to cease operations and or a civil fine of up to, of up to $1,000 per violation. In addition to the potential civil fines noted, a person or organization that fails to follow state COVID-19 mandates designed to protect the public health from this dangerous virus and its impact may, under certain circumstances, also be criminally prosecuted for reckless endangerment pursuant to Alaska statute. Reckless endangerment is defined as follows. Part A, a person commits a crime of reckless endangerment if a person recklessly engages in conduct which creates a substantial risk of serious physical injury to another person. And B, reckless endangerment is a Class A misdemeanor. Pursuant to Alaska statute, a defendant convicted of a Class A misdemeanor may be sentenced to a definite term of imprisonment of not more than one year. Additionally, under Alaska statute, a person may be fined $25,000 for a Class A misdemeanor, and a business organization may be sentenced to pay a fine not exceeding the greatest of $2.5 million for a misdemeanor offense that results in a death, or $500,000 for a Class A misdemeanor offense that does not result in death. Now, those are some very large numbers. And if a customer pressures a business to relax the rules, and that business gets caught, that's what you would be doing to that business. And at the same time, any business owners that think, these rules are stupid, I'm not going to follow these rules, that's what you're inviting. Now, I don't mention that to in any way discourage businesses from opening or customers going to business or anything like that. I'm just, these, these are just the facts. And it's why we believe that it's important for both sides of the transaction to understand what's going on. So with that, let's dive in now and kind of look at a summary of, and, and this is just going to be sort of an overview of the different categories of business under phase two. The things, some of the businesses that were allowed to open under phase one can now expand their capacity and change some of the practices a little bit. Other businesses that were shuttered under Phase 1 are now able to begin reopening at limited capacity if they choose to do so. And this is another key point. Before we drill down into the attachments, let's emphasize again that a business is not required to open up. If they don't think they can do it safely or they don't think it's in the best interest of the community, you know, if a restaurant is allowed to operate at 50% capacity now, but they don't feel that that's smart for some reason, they can still do curbside only. Every business has that choice. These state regulations just define the parameters, and the individual merchant has the option to do what they choose within the confines of these. So the first of the attachments... Attachment D is called Non-Essential Public-Facing Businesses Generally. And it says it doesn't include retail. And those types of businesses can resume operations if they meet all of the following requirements here. They say that reservations are encouraged, walk-ins are permitted if a visitor log is kept, and has sufficient information to be able to contact a visitor should the need arise. That's for contact tracing, of course. If they can trace 
uh, if somebody it becomes a positive case, they want to be able to trace everywhere that person went. And a lot of the phase two protocols for different types of businesses include logging. So there again, that's a thing to expect when you're a walk-in to one of these. So reservations encouraged, walk-ins are okay with logging. Strongly encouraged that cloth face coverings be worn by all employees. No more than 50% maximum building occupancy. Groups or parties need to be limited to household members only. Social distancing of at least six feet. There needs to be a COVID-19 mitigation plan on file. And entryway signage must notify the public of the business's COVID-19 mitigation plan and clearly state that anyone with symptoms can't come in. That's just an overview. Now, there's a lot more in all of these about hygiene protocols, cleaning and disinfecting, and, and so forth. It'll take 30 years to get through all of that. But that's those are the parameters for, again, what they call non-essential public-facing businesses in general. Now, the next attachment here is retail businesses. That's attachment E. Main rules, no more than 50% maximum occupancy. Social distancing of at least six feet. Cloth face coverings strongly encouraged. Limit household party size per visit. This, this is a, a one that's been talked about a lot. You know, if, if all, say you've got a family of four and all four of you are riding around in the car, just send one person in to do the business and do the transactions rather than taking everybody in is, is what they're recommending. These retail businesses should have a mitigation plan and that same entryway signage. And again, there's, there's a lot more in here, but that's kind of the general overview. Now, attachment F, dine-in services at restaurants. Restaurants can resume table service dining if social distancing protocol is maintained. Buffets and salad bars have to be closed. You have to have a mitigation plan to minimize direct contact between employees and customers. Dine-in Space has to be limited to 50% of maximum building occupancy. If the restaurant has a bar, that bar can only use 25% of its seating. And the total bar and restaurant can't be more than 50% of the building occupancy. Groups are still limited to household members only. Walk-ins are now permitted. This is a change. It used to have to be reservation only. Walk-ins are now permitted if, again, a visitor log is kept so that a visitor can be contacted if the need arises. Cloth face coverings for all employees interacting with the public, entryway signage, and a mitigation plan on file, etc. And that's attachment F if you want to look at more of the details. Then we move to personal care services. That's attachment G, and that's hair salons, hairdressers, day spas, nail salons, manicures, barbershops, barbers, tattoo shops, tattoo artists, body piercing, tanning, acupressure. I know we have at least one acu. Well, is it acupressure or acupuncture? Acu something. Personal care services can resume if they do reservations only. Walk-ins are prohibited for these folks. No person is allowed to stay in a waiting area, and the waiting service, the waiting area shouldn't have magazines or anything like that. Anybody that operates one of these kinds of businesses shouldn't do anything to tempt people to use a waiting area. Only the customer getting the service can enter the shop unless it's a parent or guardian accompanying a, a minor or someone with disabilities, that kind of thing. Limit of one customer per staff person performing personal care services. So you can't have two customers and one stylist or colorist or whatever. It's one-to-one. -one. No more than 50% maximum business occupancy. Social distancing. Workstations have to be a greater than six feet apart if you've got like a hair salon with multiple seats or whatever. Customers must receive 
pre-visit telephonic consultation to screen for symptoms consistent with COVID-19, recent travel, exposure to people with suspected infection, and so forth. So when you make a reservation, expect to be asked, have you been confirmed positive? Are you currently experiencing or have you currently experienced these various symptoms that are listed? Have you been in close contact with someone who's sick? Have you traveled out of state in the last 14 days? Have you been in close contact with anyone who's been out of state? And these are all listed out. So the business owner doesn't have to, and this is personal care again, they don't have to do this from scratch. They'll no doubt have these questions available. And you see here again, now as a customer, if you have a favorite hairstylist or something and you call to make the reservation and they don't ask you this stuff, warn them. You know, say, hey, did you know about the questions that you're supposed to ask me when you make the reservation. I'm not going to tattle on you, but uh, did you know about that? You know, businesses help the customers, customers help the businesses. This is what both the chamber and your local radio stations believe. So that's a summary of Attachment G on personal care services. Attachment H, non-essential, non-public facing businesses. Cloth face coverings are encouraged. All occupied desks, cubicles, open workspaces should be at least six feet apart. Any high-risk employee must be provided an alternate workspace and or special accommodations. So that would be, you know, again, your immune-compromised people, your seniors. Employers should make efforts to maximize remote work opportunities and they need to have a mitigation plan. The rest of this, again, has mostly to do with internal office stuff, which I expect these types of businesses will be looking up, but that's attachment H. Day camps for attachment I. The main, you know, if we were going to, there's a lot of material in here, uh, which, again, would be good to go over, and it has a lot to do with social distancing and so forth, but but the kind of the main thing that they're, highlighting for phase two is having group sizes be no more than 20 children and if there are multiple groups to keep them from mixing with one another you know so say you've got your you know you've got a camp and it has elementary kids and then it's got junior high kids and high school kids well you have each one of those be its own group and and don't have them mixing with one another is is the is the main goal of this i would say again kind of in summary that if you are going to run a day camp or if you're going to send your kids to a day camp it would be good to it would take me forever again to go through this one but it would be good to read this attachment i under mandate 16 both the parents or guardians should read it. The proprietor should read it. That way everybody knows what to expect. And there's no temptation, you know, when you get them there, thinking that it's going to be a certain way when, in fact, legally it has to be another way Then that, you know, doesn't cause consternation. But there's stuff in here about buses and vans and bike rides and hikes and napping, dealing with high-touch areas, cloth face coverings whenever possible, and safe. Moving on to fishing charters in Phase 2. Passengers need to bring their own food and drinks on board, and that stuff needs to be kept separate from the cruise supplies. Shouldn't pass or share fishing rods. Strongly encouraged to wear cloth face coverings. Crew members need to clean or dispose of face coverings in accordance with Health Alert 10. And again, this is in the fishing charter attachment, attachment J. Maintain social distancing as much as possible, ideally six feet. Passengers and crew from the same household aren't required to do that, but people from different households need to. Captain's got to have a mitigation plan, and signage needs to be posted. If the people chartering are from the same household, then the charter can be the full legal capacity of the boat, 
if the pass if the patrons are a mix of non household members, then the charter can be at fifty percent of the legal load or capacity. And then there's stuff about sanitizing and staffing and disinfecting and so forth. So that's attachment J for fishing charters. Now, gyms and fitness centers. This is a new one. These are facilities that weren't allowed to be open before, or if they were, they had to do stuff outside. So this would be, for example, if Badarki wanted to open back up, or and I don't know whether they're going to, but this, this would apply to that type of facility. Reservations are encouraged. Walk-ins are permitted if a visitor log is kept, same as the restaurants and those other businesses that we were talking about. So expect to sign in and provide contact information. Indoor activity is limited to 25% of maximum building occupancy. Outdoor activity is limited to a maximum of 50 people. And cloth face coverings for that, for spectators, actually. It says it's strongly encouraged that spectators wear cloth face coverings. Social distancing of at least 10 feet between non-household individuals for fitness activities. The facility should provide clear markings to indicate where each person should stand in order to maintain the 10-foot distance. It's 10 feet, of course, because you're expelling more air and particles and so forth when you're exercising. Workout equipment should be spaced to maintain 10 feet of distance. Face coverings strongly encouraged for all employees. Need to have a mitigation plan. Need to have your entryway signage. Each participant must be screened prior to the activity, and the screening, where reasonably feasible, should be done electronically in advance because of pens and touch screens and so forth not being awesome. And then they go on to say restrooms can be open but need to be cleaned hourly. Locker rooms have to be addressed in the plan and conform to the health mandates or they have to be closed. Steam room saunas and jacuzzis are not allowed to open. Water fountains and vending machines either have to be in the plan or turned off and marked out of order. Equipment can't be shared between patrons at the same time unless they're from the same household, and the stuff has to be fully disinfected prior to the next participant's use. Patrons should arrive already in their workout or active wear. You're not encouraged to change when you arrive. So there's kind of an overview of that, and the details on this are attachment K. Lodging and overnight camping in attachment L. That's overnight cabins for rental, RV parks, tent sites, privately owned campgrounds, bed and breakfasts, hotels, motels, and inns. Reservations encouraged, walk-ins permitted with logging. Businesses should take reservations online or by phone and encourage electronic payment. When contacted for a reservation, a representative of the business must ask if the group consists only of household members and can rely on the group's answer. Campsites, tent sites, and RV sites need to be spaced apart. And then a lot of similar information here about social distancing, posting your signage, got to have a mitigation plan. So that's a quick summary for those. Now, this is a big one uh, that there's been, obviously, a lot of public chatter about. Social, religious, and other gatherings. It starts out by reminding Alaskans that the stay-at-home order, Mandate 11, was lifted. But when you're in public, make every effort to maintain social distance and cloth face coverings are strongly encouraged. Anybody that is symptomatic still needs to isolate in their home. So don't go, if, if you're sick, don't go out in, in public. And 72 hours is still the time period that you're supposed to be symptom-free before you do anything outside other than get medical care. So you not only shouldn't be part of a gathering if you're sick, but you shouldn't be out of your house. Now, for social or other gatherings generally... There's a section here that has to do with, say, political gatherings, union fundraising, any other types of group events. 
and meetings of individuals from different households. No gathering larger than 50 people is allowed, including the number of people to facilitate the event. So if, if it takes five people to organize and run the thing, then you can have 45 attendees. Or if it's an indoor deal, the maximum is 50% of the building's occupancy. So if you're trying to have an event in a building that holds 40 people, the maximum number of people you could have in there was, is, is 20. And it's whichever is smaller. No larger than 50 people or 50% maximum occupancy, whichever is less. Gatherings may include non-household members if they social distance of, with, with six feet. If singing or projecting a voice is involved, then it should be a minimum of 10 feet between each person unless face coverings are worn. And if the event is in a public building, not an individual's home, there needs to be the same mitigation plan on file and the entry signage. They also recommend that people enter and exit through different entries using one-way traffic where possible. And the organizer or facility must provide hand-washing capability or sanitizer. For outdoor gatherings, can't be more than 50 people. Six feet of social distance. Again, unless you're singing or projecting the voice, then it's 10 feet. Then they have a different section for religious gatherings. For indoor services, no more than 50 people, which includes the necessary personnel. You know, if you've, you've got a pastor and somebody playing the piano and, say, two people to pass the plate. So if you've got four people, oh, and your PowerPoint person. So, you know, there again, if you've got five people required to conduct the, surfa- the, the service, then that would mean... 45 people in the pews. Gatherings can be from different households. Six feet of distancing generally. Ten feet if you're singing or projecting with the voice. Cloth face covering should be worn when possible. There has to be a mitigation plan. The church will just say church for the sake of simplicity. I know there are different types of religious gathering places, but the, uh, the building, the place of worship, needs to have a mitigation plan. It's got to have the signage out and use different entrance and exit points with one-way traffic when possible. The facility has to provide hand washing or sanitizer. Establish protocols for sacrament, communion, or collecting offerings with minimal handling of the offering plate and money and proper sanitization of hands and disinfecting of surfaces. For outdoor services, no gathering larger than 50, six feet of separation in general, 10 feet for singing or projection of voice, and the attachment has more information that can be useful. By the way, did anybody besides me see that it was a Catholic church somewhere, and the... uh, I don't know whether you say in, in Catholicism, if you say pastor or the, the father or the, you know, whoever was in charge of the thing that was, that was doing holy water, put it in a squirt gun. <laughs> I thought that was, that's great, man. I love creativity and a sense of humor while practicing the faith. So in order to maintain distance, loaded up a squirt gun with holy water and, and was uh, applying it that way. Brilliant. Okay, another new group of facilities allowed to be open. Libraries, museums, and archives. Cloth face coverings, strongly suggested for employees and members of the public. No more than 25% of capacity. Social distancing of six feet. And each facility must have a mitigation plan. That's the summary. The rest of it is the hygiene protocols and staffing for the the people who operate the facility. And that's attachment O. Swimming pools. I haven't heard whether ours is going to open or not. But if it does, pools can resume operations if each participant is screened prior to entering the pool or locker room. If you're sick, do not go. 
Of course, in general, if you're sick, don't be out of your home anyway, except for medical care. No participant can be in the pool within 72 hours of exhibiting a fever. Screening should be done in advance. No observers at practices or indoor events except parents or guardians. And parents or guardians need to maintain six feet of distance. Face coverings to be worn by all patrons and employees except within the water. Social distancing of six feet. When possible, that should be 10 feet by non-household members while swimming or being in the pool in general. Try to stay 10 feet away. Avoid congregating on the deck of the pool or common areas. Occupancy of the pool can't be more than 50% of its legal maximum capacity. And entryway signage has to be there. Now, again, I haven't heard whether our pool's going to try to open or not. But that's how it would work. Okay, here's another one. Uh, an, another category of business that was not allowed to be open under Phase 1, but now can be under Phase 2, and that is bars, attachment Q. Bars can resume operations if they maintain social distancing protocols and develop a mitigation plan. For indoor participation, groups are limited to household members only. So no sitting next to your coworker that lives in a different house or something for an after work drink unless you are six feet away, maybe ten feet away. I think it's ten feet. So anyway, groups limited to household members only limit maximum indoor capacity to twenty five percent. Tables have to be at least ten feet apart. Non household patrons seated at the bar should be seated at least six feet apart. For outdoors, groups are limited to household members only, no more than 20 tables. Tables have to be 10 feet apart. General operations, walk-ins are permitted if a log in or if a log is kept for contact tracing again. Cloth face coverings strongly urged for employees. Entryway signage has to be there. Again, got to have a mitigation plan. And then there's stuff for the staff about sanitizing and changing out drink coasters. No communal food among non-household members. So if you do a basket of peanuts or something, usually that that can only be that that those can't be passed around between people that aren't in the same household. Got to provide hand sanitizer or hand washing capability for staff and patrons. And then it goes on with cleaning and disinfecting and so forth. So 25% reopening for bars. Theaters are allowed to begin reopening, which was not the case in Phase 1. No more than 25% capacity. There have to be two seats between each non-household member to provide for at least six feet of distance and limit seating to every other row. Cloth face coverings are strongly encouraged. Reservations are required. Walk-ins are prohibited. Theaters have to have a plan. Theaters have to have entryway signage. Each customer needs to be screened prior to the activity. Sick people can't come in. Have to offer sanitizer or hand-washing capability. Water fountains and vending machines have to be addressed in the plan or made non-accessible. Theaters have to conduct pre-shift staff screening and maintain a staff screening log. So again, I don't know if there are any plans for the North Star Theater to do things again, but that's an overview of what to expect. Bowling alleys, I don't think we have to worry about. You know, I'm curious, though. You talk about a Petri dish of what are they going to do with the bowling balls? Oh, here it is. Encourage people to bring their own ball Public bowling balls have to be sanitized every four hours, and disinfectant spray has to be available for the public. Okay. So I guess you can spritz stuff in the holes to clean them. And sanitizing shoes, obviously. I mean, it's not like bowling alleys are the only place that have the potential to be really gross, but 
that one was just, you know, with everybody sticking their fingers in public bowling balls. And, you know, for the sake of time, there's there's one about bingo halls. There's one about organized sports. Well, maybe let's take a quick look at organized sports. Well, maybe let's not because this goes on forever. But there is, suffice it to say, there is there is provision for what they call organized sports activities and guided recreation. It's attachment U. And there really isn't a good way to summarize this because it goes on forever. But uh, if you're interested in what's allowed, take a look at that one. And then there's also guidance in attachment V for licensed child care facilities under phase two, which again is fairly extensive. I would imagine a licensed child care facility planning on operating is reading this, but if you plan to take advantage of that service, it would be a good idea as a customer, as a, as a client, to take a look at that. So all of this information, and that's the last one, attachment V, all of this information is available at the state site covid19.alaska.gov look for the section about the health mandates go to health mandate 16 that's the reopen alaska responsibly plan health mandate 16 you'll see the general information an overview of the plan and then this big old list of attachments d through v and then that stuff about enforcement with those big bad ugly fines i mentioned earlier which, again, to, to me and, and to the chamber, too, Kathy Renfeld's been very open about this, that, that in order to avoid getting a business in trouble, it's really good for the proprietors and the customers to know what's going on so they can help each other be successful. So customers have businesses to go to, and businesses can operate legally and safely without being subject to, in some cases, up to $2.5 million in punishment. And, I mean, as ugly as that sounds, the potential for loss of life by not following these safety guidelines, you know, is that would be, if somebody got somebody dead as a result of not doing this the way it's supposed to be done, that's, that's a tragedy that goes beyond $2.5 million. So that's an overview of phase two. And if you really want good information and guidance, we're going to recommend again reaching out to the Cordova Chamber of Commerce because they are working on this with tenacity and vigor. They know the things and they have information on their website. They invite you to get in touch with them by, by call, not literally touch, but <laughs> you know what I mean. Give them a call, email, visit their webpage. I think they have all these attachments on their webpage as well. In fact, I'm going to pull it up here. Yeah, it's if you go to the page and then look for the Come Back Better section, they talk about having templates, having best practices information, guides to the various relief, the loans and the grants that are available. If you go to their COVID-19 resources, They've got summaries of mandates and rules, not just the state stuff, but the city stuff as well. The mutual aid agreements. Remember, any business that's operating, essential, non-essential, big, little, every business operating in Cordova has to have a mutual aid agreement on file with the city. So, you know, if we have a bar, for example, that's been shuttered, before you reopen, in addition to following the state rules, make sure you download one of those mutual aid agreements and have that on file because you're going to be out of compliance if you don't have that. So, again, the Chamber's got a lot of assets, and they're, they're pretty easy to find. If you go to the main page, just scroll down, and you'll see that, especially that Come Back Better section. That's one of them. That kind of deals with the... The things that we talked about with Kathy on the show, the psychology of it and, and uh, you know, I mean, the chamber has every intention of seeing the business community be stronger after this. That's what their goal is, not just to get back, but but to be in even better shape with new ideas and new business models and ways to be more successful. So come back better is a good section. 
under business resources on the chamber site. And then also under business resources is the Cordova COVID-19 resources link with all kinds of really good information. So we strongly recommend checking that out. And we want to thank you for joining us for today's town meeting program brought to you by Cordova Wireless Communications on AM 1450 KLAM. We can't do a lot of the things that we do, not just the, this show, but in general, without the help of Cordova Wireless and their sister operation there, Cordova Telephone Cooperative. Anything missed in the 10 a.m. hour will be brought unto you next, followed by music once we eventually get to that point. Remember music? Remember the daily briefings will be coming up in the 1 p.m., 5 p.m., and 8 p.m. hours as always. We'll see if there's any new Phase 2 information to be shared in there. This show, in case you missed part of it or want to hear it again or want to recommend it to somebody, this show will be archived on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Cordova TV. Thanks to Robbie for putting that together. And we wish you all the best for the remainder of this Tuesday. Great to have you with us.